But today we're talking about the book of Revelation. And we're talking about, we're in Revelation 6. So let's go to Revelation 6. Let's turn there. I want to show you some things tonight. Dealing with the uh, six, uh, chapter 6 and the fourth horseman. The four horsemen, or the fourth horseman. And so we're in verse 7 and 8. So let's jump there. We won't review anything this time uh, uh, with the other horses. We're going to jump right into that fourth horseman. It says in verse 7, when he opened the fourth seal, Christ, he's the he, Christ is the he, John, this isn't opening anything. Uh, Christ is opening the seal. Remember, this is still a continuation from chapter 5. I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him, or Hell followed him. And they were given authority over the fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with the famine and with pestilence and, with, and by the wild beasts of the earth. And so we talked about this horse on Sunday. We kind of dealt with the pale horse and, you know, who this last horseman is. And, 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 and remember, guys, these four horsemen provide for us a wide overview of the horrific judgments that God will unleash on the world during the seven-year tribulation. So I always want to keep that in your mindset. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are the judgments from heaven. They're not the acts of Satan. They're not the acts of the Antichrist. And we have to keep saying that. I want to keep drilling that, that these four horsemen. Because think about it. When you thought about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, I mean, because most people have heard the story. They've heard about the, the white horse, the red horse, the green, you know, the, 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 the pale horse, the black horse. But you, you mostly think of these things as like something coming out of hell. Mm -hmm. You know, like they galloped out of the bottomless pit. <laughs> you know, that the devil unleashed his horsemen. And, and, and even in movies, they make them be like the devil is orchestrating them. Mm -hmm. Like the devil is in charge. These are his four generals that he sent out. And I think that's a gross mischaracterization of the book of Revelation because we see that these horsemen, watch this, guys, they don't originate in hell. They originate out of heaven. <laughs> they come from the throne. <laughs> Remember, it was the living creature that summons them. He says, come, and behold, John sees this horse. And so I think that's the understanding that we got to get, guys, that, the, that these horsemen are divinely ordained and divinely controlled. Think about it, guys. If you go look at the white horse, what does it say about the white horse? A crown was given to him. Was given to him. Yes, we know the people are going to do it, but, but, but why are the people doing it? Because God is allowing it. God is allowing this Antichrist spirit to rise and, and spread across the earth during the tribulation period. Look at the, what did it say about the red horse? And it was permitted to take peace from the earth. Notice that it was permitted. Who gave it permission? Heaven. Heaven did. When we looked at the black horse, remember the black horse? It says, a voice in the midst of the four living creatures said what? It said a denarius for a, 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 a quart of wheat and a denarius for three, bar, three quarts of barley. Who said that? God said that. God is the one gave the black horse its parameters. And just like that with the pale horse, notice what it says about the pale horse. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth. They were given authority. Each horseman is following specific orders from the one who is seated on the throne. Okay? The tribulation is not worldly chaos. It is divine judgment. It is not worldly chaos. It is divine judgment. Now think about all that we've been talking about. It would just seem like this is chaos going crazy. Chaos on steroids. But it is not chaos on steroids. It is divine judgment. It is divine judgment. And on this past Sunday, we talked about the pale horse and its partner, Hale. Remember, this is the one horseman that has a partner that travels with it. He's, he has a tonto. You see, he has a robin, and the robin is Hale. The pale horse is the death that will flow throughout the entire period of the tribulation that will slaughter billions of the unredeemed. This is why Hale follows him. 
hell follows him. Why? Because death will claim the body while hell will claim the soul. Death will claim the body and hell will claim the soul. And remember, just right quickly, we went over to Luke, Luke chapter 12, verses 4. It said, I think it's verses 4 through 5. Listen to what it says there. This is Jesus talking. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. That's for the believer. See, that death is for the believer. It kills the body. But that's it. You know, I mean, again, nobody wants their body to be killed. So think about it. Your body can be killed a lot of ways. It can be mangled by an animal. It can be mangled in a car accident. It can be shot. It, it can die of a disease. It can do all this. But notice what Jesus says. That's it. <laughs> but then he goes into the second kind of death, which is for the unbeliever. He says, but I warn you whom you shall fear. Fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And don't miss that part. It says, after he has killed. Okay. <laughs> he didn't get the... Who is he talking... Who is the he there? The devil? He's talking about his father, God. He's talking about God. 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 So the remainder of verse 8, if we go back to Revelation... Uh, chapter 6 verse 8 the remainder of that verse deals with how death and hell will slaughter the unredeemed okay now let's look at the B clause of verse 8 it says there and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the beasts of the earth now Notice that authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth. The word authority here in the Greek means power to act. It means, listen to this, conferred power. It means delegated empowerment to operate in a designated jurisdiction. So in other words, when, when this scripture says they were given authority, they're giving a delegated power from God to act in a certain jurisdiction. So what's the jurisdiction? A fourth of the a part of the earth. You get it? So in other words, I mean, it's amazing. God is still controlling the parameters. Remember, he does that to Satan in Job. Remember, he tells Satan, he says, hey, you can touch all that he's had, but you can't touch his body. And then remember in chapter 2, Satan comes back and says, ah, skin for skin, oh man, it didn't work the first time because you didn't let me touch his body. Well, let me touch his body, I guarantee you, curse you. And God didn't say, okay, go ahead and kill him. No, God says, okay, you can go ahead and touch his body, but you can't kill him. So notice who has the control. Furthermore, Jesus says he has death, hell, and the keys to death and the grave, and it's, he got them. He got the keys. The devil doesn't control who gets to die. Wow. I mean, that'll preach. You know, we was watching a movie uh, on Monday. It's a movie night that we had with the family. We all sit and watch a movie. So we was watching this movie. I ain't going to tell you the name of it. Like, Why y'all watching this movie? And so <laughs> in the movie, it, the, 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 the devil that came and it was like kind of snuffing out people and all this. And so after it was over, I used it as an opportunity. I was talking to the kids and I said, like Jasmine and LJ, I was like, let me explain something to you. I said, the devil doesn't have any authority to just kill people at will. I said, in other words, he just can't come along and just, I just feel like killing people. All right, okay. If that were the case, then why talk to Eve in the garden? Right. Why not everybody that God created, the devil just kill him? Sure. So as soon as God made Adam and Eve, kill him. And then God make another one, kill him. God make another one, kill him. Why not kill all the Christians? If that was the case, if the devil had a part with it, just kill however he wanted to, then just unleash his demons and fallen angels to kill all Christians. No, he doesn't. Remember, he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. As a, as a, it didn't say he's a roaring lion. He's as one. He's the prince in power, a, a dragon that fills the air. You see what I mean? And so when we look at that, we understand that the jurisdiction of this pale horse is over a fourth part of the world's population. Now this fourth part of the world, I'm going to explain this, is of the unbelievers. Now follow this, guys. 
It is believed by most that believers who get saved during the tribulation will not be killed by the judgments of God. The believers will be killed by the Antichrist. Y'all follow me here? Okay. The believers will be martyred. They won't be killed by the judgments of God. Like, in other words, the judgments of God are specifically poured out on the unbelieving world. Well, somebody says, well, what about the believers who will die? They're going to be martyred. Notice that it says, even if you go and when we talk about this on Sunday, it talks about that fifth seal in verse uh, 9 in, in Revelation 6, 9. It says that he opened the fifth seal and I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. Why were they slain? For the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And notice that they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign God, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Notice that these tribulation saints are asking for vengeance to avenge their blood. What does that mean? They were killed. We remember that language. Remember when, when, when the Bible talks about when Cain killed Abel? And what does God say about the blood of Abel? It said it cried out. Well, what, what did the blood of Abel cry out? Vengeance. Vengeance. And so we see that the, the believers are martyred. The martyred believers are crying out for, for the Lord to avenge them. Furthermore, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, it talks about that these were the souls of those who were beheaded. So notice that the tribulation saints were beheaded. The believers are martyred. The unbelievers are slaughtered. Okay? The believers during the tribulation that get saved during the tribulation are going to be martyred. The unbelievers, on the other hand, are going to be slaughtered. And what's going to do that? The judgments of God. Very important that you get the distinction there. Now, we stated, we've stated that a fourth part of the earth, that there are now... When I was looking this up, there are two possibilities of interpretation on what it means by the fourth part of the earth. Let me give you both of them. A fourth part of the earth, number one, uh, one interpretation is that it represents 25% of the earth's population. At the numbers that we have at 7.1 billion, that comes out to be 1.88 billion people. That's 25%. Now listen to this. Currently, of the seven continents, Asia has a total population, remember there's seven continents, Asia has a total population of 4.6 billion, Africa has 1.3 billion, Europe has 747 million, North America has 592 million, South America has 430 million, Australia has 42 million, and Antarctica has zero. So, Notice this, 25% of the world's population is the equivalent of wiping out Europe, North America, South America, and Australia. So, I want to give you like a, a, a so you can kind of get a, your hands wrapped around 25%. Because 25% is, a, you know, out of a dollar, that's 25 cents. That's not much, that's not much, man, I flick that over the wall. Well, 25% of the world's population is the equivalent of wiping out Europe, North America, South Africa, and Australia. Yes, all four of those continents. That's how many will die. Think of everybody in North America dying, everybody in South America dying, everybody in Europe dying. Oh, and then Australia. Wow. <laughs> that number there is staggering when we look at it. This is unbelievable death. Well, another interpretation of this fourth part of the earth means that it represents territories. Now watch this, guys. As a territory, in other words, it, it, it is known as a Jewish tradition where God kind of divides the earth into parts. Right. And so the fourth part of the earth would be Europe under the height of the Roman Empire. 
So, but this interpretation, guys, doesn't seem to fit the context of the tribulation because the tribulation is not an overseas judgment. It is God's wrath and judgment being poured out on the earth. Remember, what does God tell the church of Philadelphia? That because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you out of the hour of testing that is coming upon the whole world to try all those who dwell on the earth. So the tribulation is not just a period where God is just judging Europe or the Middle East. It's a judgment poured out on everything. So I don't think that that interpretation holds, guys. But let's say even if you went with that interpretation, that means the death would still be unimaginable because if you just say a fourth part of the earth is just Europe, well, that's 747 million people. That's still a lot of people, guys. Can you imagine all of Europe being wiped out? Italy, Spain, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, uh, Great Britain, all of them, gone. Russia, gone. Guys, that's still a lot of people. And so now, here's what it says about this. In order for these, this horseman to do its job, there are four ways that God is giving him authority. We see it in the verse there. It says here, and they are given a fourth part of the earth to kill with what? The sword, that's one. Famine is two. Pestilence is three. And wild beasts of the earth is four. So this pale horseman has four weapons he can use. Okay? Now, watch this. The word sword there is the Greek word rum fire. Now you guys will remember that because it talks about what comes out of the mouth of the Lord. It says that he has a two-edged sword. Remember I told you that's rum fire. That's not a machaira. A machaira is the little dagger type sword. A rum fire is the Conan, the He-Man sword. This is a broad sword. So in other words, when it talks about he can use the sword, this is a broad sweeping judgment that he can use. The pale horse will kill unbelievers through number one, bloodshed. Mainly through war and civil unrest. I mean, we're getting a taste of what this could look like. I mean, we're seeing civil unrest, but you know, we haven't seen mayhem and murder take place in the middle of the streets. We're seeing civil unrest in, this time, in the sense of, you know, people defacing property and throwing things. But, but, but what happens when you have civil unrest that ensues in murder and bloodshed? And remember, Jesus talks about that in Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 to 7. It says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you're not alarmed because the end is not yet. It says, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So notice that Jesus kind of gives us a picture of what this war will look like. Number one, you will have wars that will be between kingdoms, but you're also going to have ethnic groups raising up against ethnic groups or tribes against tribes. Y'all get what I'm saying? So I can see how the bloodshed, do you know... Uh, there were, uh, you can find this on, on, uh, on uh, uh, Google, you can Google it. I think it was in Indiana. Or maybe, uh, was it Indiana? Yeah, it was in Indiana. You, they, were, they were doing the protest, a very peaceful protest, and, and they were coming back from the protest. Right, right. And as they were coming back from the protest, the, the black protesters went through a, all a, kind of like a white neighborhood, and all the white uh, young people were out there with guns in their hands watching the, the blacks of uh, march by. And you say, well, man, that's, that's kind of creepy. Well, but, but I'm telling you how you can see ethnic group rise up against ethnic group. You can see how what you have going on now could, could easily spew out because it can lead to a lot of hate groups. And here's the deal. Not only do you have the Ku Klux Klan, that's a hate group, but you got Black Panthers. You got other militant black groups and militant white groups that can come out and now all of a sudden you know let's say the, the, the white militant groups get tired of it they say man you know we, we had enough of this man and then they, they just go start killing and then you got the black militants start they start doing nothing 
Then you throw in the Latinos. Then you throw in everybody else. You can see how you can have this thing spew out. We also know about ethnic groups and tribal wars with the Sunni and the Shiite Muslims. Right, right, right. Watch this, guys. Did you know Pakistani and India? They're really like the same people, right. but Indians hate Pakistanis and Pakistanis hate Indians. True. I mean, Africa had the same Tribal, tribe in Africa. We see it all the time. In other words, we know that this is very possible. We can see how this is possible. We're living in it. Why? Because sin will be let off its leash and the depravity of man will be in full operation. So because sin is let off its leash now, now all of a sudden man can be depraved. He can go as bad as he wants to now. You know, as bad as he can possibly get. And, and, and I really believe we're going to see a, a, a glimpses of that. Well, well, the tribulation will see glimpses of it. I really do. I believe the restraint, the, 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 the training wheels are going to... Think about it, what we're seeing now is seeing restraint. Correct. What happens when the restrainer lets go of the, the leash? How bad do you think man can get? We see glimpses of it with murderers. With heinous murderers, Jeffrey Dahmer would be one. Son of Sam would be another one. Uh, 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 what's the one who heard the voices? Uh, had the little cult group. Uh, Charles Manson. Charles Manson. Yeah, who would you say? You said Bronson, right? Oh, Jones. Yeah, Jim Jones. You, you, you can see how bad man can get. But I'm telling you guys, I don't think I don't think the world has seen anything into the tribulation. And so he's going to be having the sword to do a lot of the killing. Number two is famine. Famine. He can use famine. Now, this is through hunger. That's what the word famine there means. The famine, though, go back to our lesson on the black horse, is the result of inflation of the food prices. Remember, Revelation 6.6 6 says that it's going to be a day's wage for a quart of wheat or a day's wage for three quarts of barley. In other words, it's going to be a day's wage for the good food and a day's wage for the bad stuff. That's literally what it's talking about. The famine will also be, also, we forgot about this. So not only will you have famine that will be a result of inflation, food prices are too high, so nobody can afford it, so that'll kill people, that'll kill poor people, why? Because they can't afford the food. And I don't know about poor people, they'll kill people who got money. <laughs> hey, hey, if it's a day's wage to feed my family, we're going to die. <laughs> because how can we feed all of us? It's too many. Somebody not gonna go eat. Somebody think about what's if it's a day's wage right. <laughs> to feed. A, so no, you're not gonna be able to do that. You're, you're just not gonna be able to do that. So many people will die as a result of the inflation. But we forgot in Revelation. Go look at Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Here's another reason for the family. Look at Revelation 13 verse 16. Revelation 13, verse 16. It says, and it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of his name. So notice that not only do you have inflation, but during the middle of the tribulation, when, it, when the beast kingdom is on the rise, what will also be causing famine? People who refuse to take the mark. Y'all get it? So not only do you have inflation that's going on, what about those who refuse to take the mark? Y'all do know it's going to be people that's not going to take the mark. It's not just going to be Christians that don't take the mark. It's going to be a people that's going to not take the mark. And so because they don't take the mark, man, say, guess what? They won't be able to buy nothing. And somebody says that's impossible, man. They still can use cash. No! Because, guys, we can see that in our society. What would happen today if you could only purchase anything? Okay, think about it. Have you ever gone, you had no cash on you, and then you went to the drive through window, and they said, our machine is down, we don't take cash. What you do? Just drive on up. I remember one time I went to Quick Trip, and their machines were down, so you couldn't get gas with the car, and you couldn't even go in there. That was the empty. I've seen the gas station because if you didn't have any, you know, either people who pay with the car, sometimes they'll go in to pay with the car. Mm -hmm. But guess what, man? You couldn't do anything. So what I'm saying is, guys, come on. We, we can see that we don't have the mark yet, but we can see how this is easily possible. Yeah. And somebody says, well, I'll just live off the earth. Well, where are you going to get the seeds from? Right. Right. 
How you going to go into town? What you going to do? You going to become one of these natives and, and, and know how to do all this stuff with your hands? You going you know how to build tools out of bamboo shoots and, and, and do all this stuff? Like the little videos on Facebook with the little guy building the pool and stuff with his hands and stuff? All that, you know, it, 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 that, that, now that's what we're going to be doing. No, guys, look here. Without having that mark, you won't be able to buy or sell anything. So guess what, guys? As a result of inflation and idolatry, many people will die because of famine. Even if you could, people going to try to take it, right? <laughs> okay, there you go. So even if you could buy it because it's so high, people are going to be robbing and stealing. That leads back to the civil unrest. Wow. And then look at number three. Go back to Revelation 6. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the third tool that this pale horse has? Now, the King James says death. But the word there is pestilence. Mm -hmm. Pestilence. 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 Now, <laughs> we've heard that word a lot lately. <laughs> pestilence. But I want to give it to you straight. The Greek word for pestilence is also the Greek word for death. It is thanatos, which means death. But the word here is better translated as pestilence or plague. Plague. Now, listen to this. The definition of a pestilence is any infectious and fatal disease that is widespread. Mercy. That's what a pestilence is. It can come in the form of a plague, right. like the bubonic plague of the Middle Ages, or it can come from the beasts of the earth right. carrying fatal infectious diseases. Yeah. Okay. So a pestilence can come two ways. It can come from a plague like the bubonic plague, which we're going to talk about, or it can come from the beasts of the earth spreading a infectious disease. Okay? So that's why I think when you look at the, the third and fourth things he has, death and the beast of the earth, you can almost put them together. But I want to show you something. Now, follow this, guys. Go to 2 Chronicles. Yes, Old Testament. Go to 2 Chronicles. You guys know this verse. Chapter 7. Look at verse 12. This is Solomon's great prayer at the dedication of the temple. Mm -hmm. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Look at verse 12. Okay? It says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. When I look, notice what he's, God says, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, mm -hmm. or send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. The reason why I wanted to point that verse out, because I wanted to show you that it was God that sends the pestilence. Right. Okay, the devil doesn't have a jar of pestilence that he can unleash. It is God that sends plagues. Y know, did y'all know that? Mm -hmm. That's good. It is God that sends pestilence as an act of judgment for disobedience and rebellion. You got to hear this, guys. Because when we think of these things, now, now again, let me say this for the tape. I'm not telling you that the coronavirus was sent by God. I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. Oh, he wanted these priests said God sent it as a judge. I didn't say that coronavirus is. But I'm talking about this, this form of pestilence. It is a specific thing where God is sending this. I mean, we can read about it all throughout the Old Testament. Yeah, we can read about it. Oh, go read about uh, Israel's journey through the wilderness for 40 years. It would be nothing for God. They would be murmuring, complaining. God is going to play it. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, people start dying. Moses had to go run and make an offer. Uh, how about this? When David numbered the people, 
Remember that? And, and it said Satan stirred him up, but then it tells us that God, God allowed Satan to stir him up because God was mad at Israel anyway for being disobedient. And so what happened? The angel shows up and tells David, okay, because of your disobedience, you can choose this. You can choose war, where the land will be devastated by war. You can choose uh, uh, famine for this long. He says, or you can choose a, a pestilence for, uh, I think it was like a, a couple of weeks that will go throughout Jerusalem. David said, man, if I, he, he, he like, man, but them eyes, I, just give me the pestilence. And the Bible says, man, that a pestilence went across Jerusalem, man, and, and, and started slaying the people. And then David went and saw a, the angel of the Lord standing with a sword over Jerusalem, getting ready to strike Jerusalem. And David went to the threshing floor. Right, right. And that's where he offered an offering. And it says, God told the angel, it is enough. Stay your hand. Don't touch Jerusalem. The angel of the Lord was sent to do the pestilence. So when we look at this, guys, we understand that this pestilence is a part of the judgment. Furthermore, we can read Ezekiel, we can read Jeremiah, and I'm telling you, man, take some time to go study this out for yourself. Over and over again, you will read about God sending pestilence as an act of judgment. You will read about it. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel and Jeremiah talked about it so much. They would tell you, God's considered the pestilence. God's considered the pestilence. God's considered the pestilence. God. And every time he would mention pestilence, guess what? They would mention sword, famine, and pestilence. Sword, famine, and pestilence. Sounds like revelation. But look at this, guys. The most famous plague in our recent history would be the bubonic plague or the Black Death. Now, of the 14th century. A fascinating study. I think they had a whole documentary on it on History Channel. I would encourage you, if you can find it, watch it. <laughs> because, it, it, you know, I, I read the transcript of it, but it, 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 it's a, if you ever want to, if you don't know what a plague is, go study the Black Death, the bubonic plague. Listen to this. It, it is estimated that anywhere between low numbers of 75 million, but the most they believe is 200 million people died as a result of the Black Plague. And actually, the History Channel stated that 60% of the world's population in Europe was killed during the outbreak of the Black Plague during 1346 to 1353. <coughs> 50, 60 percent of Europe's population. 60. Wow. Listen to what the great Renaissance poet Patriarch wrote about the Black Pig. I want you to read. Please listen to this, guys. Listen to what this is what that he lived during that time. As a matter of fact, Patriarch, he actually lost his wife and his kids to the plague. He buried them. Now, listen to what he says. He says, all the citizens did little else except to carry dead bodies to be buried. And every church they dug deep pits down to the water table, and thus those who were poor, who died during the night, were bundled up quickly and thrown into the pit. So everybody would die at night, and then you would just collect the bodies in the houses and just throw them over into a pit. In the morning, when a large number of bodies were found in the pit, they took some earth, and shoveled it down on top of them, and later others were placed on top of them. And then another layer of earth, then other bodies was placed on them. He says, just as one makes lasagna with layers of pasta and cheese. <laughs> I know, right? That's what the bodies, they were just like stacked on top of each other like this. Another writer during that time stated that there were also those who were so sparsely covered with earth that the dogs dragged them forth and devoured their bodies throughout the city. Wow. Guys, the Black Death was an epidemic called the bubonic plague. Now, the bubonic plague is a disease caused by bacterium, your I can't really say that word. It's Yersinia pestis. That's what the that's what it is. It's a it's it's a bacterium. It's like a, a you know what a bacteria is. A bacteria is like a rod shaped organism. 
It's a living organism. Remember, a bacteria is a living organism. And so it's like a little small rod shaped uh, 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 bacteria. And it, cir it circulates among wild rodents where, they're where they live in large numbers and in great density. In other words, it is a bacteria that is found in rodents, in rats. Okay? The plague arises around humans when rodents in a human a habitation, normally black rats, because they, uh, when the black rats get infected, the black rats are normally what's known as the common house rat. The black rats are also known as ship rats. I remember when we was in the Navy, when we were, when we were pulling to a port, we would put out these big old rat guards. We call them rat guards. They would be on the mooring lines, and they would be large, big circles that were shaped like this so the rat couldn't climb over and come to the ship. Because I promise you, when they didn't have them up, and it would be a sight to see, you would see these black rats. They would crawl up the little ropes to go right on into the ship. And you didn't want a rat to get in the ship because that could affect all the sailors. Okay? So they didn't want that to happen. And so the black rat is normally known as the house rat. So that's the one that, was get, that, that got affected. And, and, and it likes to live around people. Then you have the gray rat that prefers to live in sewers and cellars. They don't like to live around people. So the bubonic plague was spread by the black rat, the common house rat. Now watch this. The plague is spread from the rats to humans through the rat flea. You got to hear this now. I know you. <laughs> As the rats were infected by the plague, they would die. So when the rat get infected with the bubonic plague, it ends up dying. Well, watch this, Elder Charles. As all the rats die, the fleas ain't got nothing to do now. So guess what the fleas do? They turn on the humans and start attacking the humans. And once the rat flea begins to attack the human, that's how the bubonic plague spreads. Now watch this, guys. Once bitten, the bacteria is carried to the lymph nodes that begins to swell and form very painful buboes. That's where they, you get the bubonic from. They, they form these painful bores or sores on you called buboes and normally these sores are found under the armpit or the groin and they're very very painful very very painful the victim begins to bleed internally then moving to respira uh, 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 respiratory it moves to the respiratory system until the entire lung is infected and it leads to a bloody cough shortness of breath and then death Death from the bubonic plague took anywhere between 8 to 10 days from the flea bite with no obvious signs occurring until it was too late. So in other words, it could be incubated in you for days and you not even know you got it. And then all of a sudden, the buboes forms under the armpit, boom, and the person could either die that day. Very painful. Once the plague hits the lung, it spreads through contaminated droplets through the cough. Now it comes a pneumonic plague. It's a pneumonia type plague now. But the black plague, however, it wasn't. I don't want. You, it wasn't transmitted like the history comes out to tell you that it was translated by by rats. No, it was the fleas. It was the fleas. Now I'm saying all this for a reason. Y'all gonna see how this makes sense. This means. That pestilence and plagues are more common, watch this guys, during warmer seasons. Unlike viruses, which are more common during what? Colder seasons. The last outbreak of the bubonic plague then was 1654, where there were over 30 waves of the black plague. From 1346 all the way to 1654. Now watch this. When we go fast forward to today, there was something called the Great Plague of London. That was the bubonic plague. That was in 1664 to 1665. It killed 70,000 people. An outbreak took place in Hong Kong in 1894, bubonic plague. That was 80,000 to 100,000 died. Now, because of modern medicine, only 15 to 20 people die each year from the bubonic plague. Did you know that? You still have some people die from it. Okay? And, 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 and now, the weaponizing of a plague is called biological warfare. Okay, then we're done. During World War II, Japan dropped plague-infested fleas on China. 
<laughs> That's cold blooded. <laughs> so you take these plague infested fleas and you just throw them out there into the Chinese population because it's warfare. That's biological warfare. Also, you guys will remember in 1991 during the Gulf War, it was confirmed that Iraq had developed biological weapons and that they had used it on their own people. You also heard about the nerve gas uh, uh, from Syria. You know, you have all different types of biological weapons. You also have anthrax. <laughs> Did you know anthrax is a biological weapon? When they were testing anthrax, anthrax is so deadly that in an infected, let's say if somebody was to come and release spores of anthrax in here, like a white sulfuric powder, looks like powder. Let's say they leach in here, you know, man, you probably wouldn't be able to come back into this place for 40 years. I mean, because the spores continue to live. And all it takes is for you to breathe them in. Ebola. All these are type virus type deals. That are, that are living organisms. So, so, so when we think about this, guys, we think about biological weapons. When we talk about what this pale horse can do, man, I mean, he, he, he's got a lot at his disposal. But when I was looking this up, the most deadly kind of plague is viruses. Did you know that? Scientists confirm today that the, influ the influenza virus or the influenza virus, uh, not influenza, I'm sorry, uh, 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 the, the, what is it, uh, the flu type virus. What is it? Influenza? Influenza. Influenza, influenza virus is the most deadliest disease because it takes a minimum of one year to develop a vaccine. In other words, before scientists can know how to create a vaccine, it's already too late. Recent reports say that science says that a pandemic of a flu type virus would decimate the population. Because hospitals would get overridden. They wouldn't be able to care for people. It, the virus can be spread through droplets in the air. They can be spread easily through people. And guess what, guys? As people die, nothing we can do about it. You just have to just keep, them, keep, keep moving them along. But watch this as we end. Go to Revelation 16. Revelation 16. Are you there? Your heading should say the seven bowls of God's wrath, right? Mm -hmm. This is what God is going to unleash on the Antichrist, on the beast kingdom. I want you to see if it sounds a little bit like the plague. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went out and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores or boils came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Remember what I talked about the warmer season, guys? Go down to verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat that cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues, they did not repent and give him glory. Wow. Could it be that one of the bold judgments is the return of the bubonic plague? Mm -hmm. And that these bowls that these unbelievers were getting was that judgment. Because we read about how God uses pestilence as a form of judgment. As we close, guys, with the teaching about these four horsemen, everybody go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14. Look at verse 21. This is Ezekiel talking about the judgment against Jerusalem. And look at what he says in Ezekiel 14, verse 21. It says, for thus says the Lord God, how much more when I send upon Jerusalem my four disastrous acts of judgment. Well, what are they? Sword, famine, wild beast, and pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. Wow. Wow. 
But behold, some survivors will be left in it. Sons and daughters who will be brought out. Behold, when they come out to you and you see their ways and their deeds, you will be consoled for the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem, for all that I have brought upon it. They will console you when you see their ways and their deeds, and you shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, declares the Lord God. Isn't that amazing? God says, how much more when I send my four disastrous acts of judgment? And what are they? Sword, famine, wild beasts, and pestilence. My God, that sounds just like the four horsemen. <laughs> that sounds just like the four horsemen. And guys, those four horsemen, that's what characterizes the entire tribulation period. And I'm telling you, man, you don't want to be any part of it, any part of it, because you're going to have deception flowing from the white horse. You're going to have warfare going from the red horse. You're going to have inflation and economic and disaster and famine from the black horse. And then on, on top of all that, you got a pale, sickly horse galloping across the earth, swallowing up people in death, and hell is behind them swallowing up the soul. Guys, it's going to be horrific judgment during the tribulation period. That's why we have to accept Jesus Christ now. That's why right. instead of talking about going out here, activating folk, and doing all this craziness, and talking about putting your hands up and defunding police, and, and, and folk need to do this, and we need to, we need to be preaching Jesus is returning. We need to be preparing as many people as we can for the return of Christ. We need to be getting saved. People say that's what the church should be doing. Amen. Amen. You are not going to stop seeing from spreading. So stop trying to cure the world. Why not try to save as many people in the world? And it first starts with yourself. Amen. Just like the, the, the flight attendant always says, before you help somebody else with their mask, how about you put your mask on? Right. So before you go out there and try to help heal the world of bad police officers, how about we get saved? Amen. Amen. How about I say yes to Jesus Christ? I bow the, bow the knee and recognize that I'm a sinner so that I can escape these things that are going on. Because it's going to happen, guys. This is where the world is going. And if you think it's bad now, you think police brutality is bad. You haven't seen any brutality until you see what God does to the planet during the tribulation period. So I want to encourage you guys, know the Lord today. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. So join with us on Sunday as we continue. Uh, uh, and we're going to continue to talk about these things as we uh, go forth, guys. Thank you guys for joining with us. To all our members of Eternal Purpose, thank you guys for joining with us. Don't forget to continue to so support the ministry. Uh, also, you can find us on the World Wide Web, EternalPurposeFellowship.com, YouTube, Eternal Purpose Fellowship. Subscribe to our page and Facebook, Eternal Purpose Fellowship. Please like the page. Until then, we'll see you on Sunday. God bless you.